the social networks need to make a profit. And if it's shown to them both sides, the story ceases to become interesting. What I would say is that COVID-19, especially during the pandemic, I think everybody realized that the web services, right, the internet, it's not the service any longer. It's a life necessity. So I think it will be quite shocking for us to think about ourselves as a capital um, owned by uh, current landlords of, of the web. Can you elaborate a little bit uh, how do you see this capital distribution? And despite perception of uh, internet democracy, how is it possibly inherently equalizing or unequal? Uh, what is your view on that? And perhaps we'll have an argument. Okay, well, here to throw fuel on the argument, uh, throughout the 20th century, there were different approaches to running an economy and contributing to innovation and technology, which would bring down prices. We want to move maybe as a society from um, competition between talking heads, let's say, who deliver biased news, and I'll explain why they deliver biased news, versus collaboration where there's concentric circles like on Wikipedia. There's a talk page where essentially people duke it out and criticize each other's contributions. And then there's a circle where people come to the main page where things have already been hashed out and most of the complaints have been addressed uh, or at least uh, debunked or rebuffed or something. Uh, the idea that not everybody in the public has to participate in the debate is crucial to collaboration, just like on Linux. Uh, so examples of open source projects or scientific projects. Linux, somebody has to vet the uh, pull request. Not everybody in the world has to be aware of what's happening there. In science, there's peer review. So not everybody has to be aware of every little suggestion. Uh, and that's important because Today, people are being asked to take on the huge burden of learning everything about everything, whether it's the medical establishment talking about the efficacy of masks and pandemic, or whether it's uh, California's forest fires or who's responsible for this or that or the other thing. You can't expect everybody to do all their research on everything when the information might not even be true. We might not even know, if, for example, a very contentious issue, whether it was Assad who bombed uh, his own citizens or whether this was done by the insurgents. And there are even sites now which have bets where you put your money uh, and you lose your money if some third party agrees and so on. So there's these things. I would like to see more collaborative approaches where if, for example, uh, one side disagrees with another side, they come together and face each other and have to have a dialogue and whatever comes out of that dialogue is what the public would see rather than the current model, like I wanna go back to what I'm saying, the current model is shaped by the profit motive. If you are middle of the road, like Walter Cronkite, here's the nightly news type of thing, um, you're going to get maybe some people watching and some people like that kind of stuff, but far more people like hearing what they like and not hearing what triggers them and what they don't like. And so as society gets more polarized, people don't want to hear the other side of a story. I understand, I understand. Right. The news agencies, right, inherently biased, that they're not working on the model of Wikipedia, and that makes them inherently biased and effectively sort of in the language of, of uh, collaboration partisan, right? Uh, that there is no nonpartisan news agency, which, which brings me back some works uh, in the Marxist and neo-Marxist tradition, for example, where this is an established fact that all media in that stream of, of thought is one way or another way political, right? And, and partisan. But you're implying that it somehow impedes freedom of speech um, and the economic freedom. And I'm struggling to see the type of connection. So if you could please elaborate, because I, I believe you do uh, have some points about it. Right, it's very important to be grounded in facts. I wouldn't say it's necessarily a fact that there are no uh, unbiased uh, news stories. Uh, it's just, uh, you can't prove a negative. Maybe there are somewhere. I'm saying that the system selects heavily for the ones that are biased. Because if they were showing both sides of a story, it would cease to be sensational because people would be like, oh, I see what happened there. It's actually not such a big deal because both sides of the, sensational outrage story were reported. 
that doesn't sell just like they used to say sex sells today outrage sells very much so if you say look what those guys just did on the other side you have to spin the story in a way that fails to mention all the mitigating factors of why they did that because then if yeah so people will reshare it and who was it winston churchill says that by the time the truth has a chance to put his pants on the lie is already halfway around the world it's not really a lie it's selective telling so someone like myself i'd like to read uh the product of both a very left wing and a very right wing or you know a very anti-vaxxer and a very vaxxer uh mindset so i could see both of them source the best arguments for their side but most times most people are not exposed to both sides which is why i'm saying both sides have to come together right away as soon as possible and not try to hide good arguments from the other side that's what's so greg, missing. Uh, greg uh, that brings that brings a very important point that i think many of the listeners have and and i think uh, i i share how do you then make sure that blatant disinformation blatant falsehoods are not like you've just uh, quoted Winston Churchill are uh, making their way around the world three times over while you are still sorting out the left and right side of your debate and i really would like to understand uh, for clarity's sake there's a lot of debate about deplatforming publishers versus platforms uh, section 230 um, what is your view on that excellent question so first of all when winston churchill said it the methods of communication were far less geographically distributed as today. Today the lie can go around the world 3000 times, not 3 times, and it will spread virally. And again, it's not necessarily a lie. It's actually often a narrative that is selectively picking, cherry picking parts of the truth. So, and and often people genuinely believe things either because they don't know the other side because it's never been told them. And again, it's being held selectively from them. because the social networks need to make a profit and if it's shown to them both sides the story ceases to become interesting so in a way the profit motive selects for selective outrage and the news media also now puts out stories that will be shared more widely it's not that the news media is specifically trying to be um uh selectively biased because they want to be it's because the market will simply select against them and select for the ones that are biased. If we're embedded in a capitalist market where all that matters is profit because you have to pay people in this hierarchical way, then this is the kind of media we will keep having. And if you look at Australia, News Corp, right, with Rupert Murdoch has an outsized influence there in the government because it's a big corporation and they recently got the government, they lobbied the government to pass a law that will actually make Facebook and Google pay the news media because advertising revenue is being sort of siphoned off and now they're not making as much and maybe subscription revenue is not th- those models are not paying enough 